Oh, you know what sometimes?
music has. So I, I wanted to start out by saying that I, in, in my preparation for my time here with you guys, I discovered some things in the Bible. I discovered some things. And one of the things that I discovered was uh, um, gospel music is also connected with singing. Okay, now there's some other aspects that I'm going to get into in my discussion, but I wanted to start out by saying this. In my, in my discovery, uh, just about 292 times in the Bible, we are commanded to sing. And I thought that was very interesting because uh, uh, that's a lot of times to, to ask for something. <laughs> You know, uh, we're, we're, we're asked to pray, we're asked to uh, be kind, we're asked to love. Um, I recently wrote a book, um, um, a devotional for women, actually, called The Fearless Woman. I discovered that there's 365 mentions of do not fear in the Bible. But to have almost 300 times the command to sing, there is a connection with singing and song and the message of song to accomplish different things in your individual life and also into your corporate life or into your gatherings. Um, um, and, and Dr. McNeil is going to talk a little bit more about that when he comes up. But I want to just kind of take you to I, I want to just take you to one scripture, and if you got a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, uh, 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 snatch it out and, and go to uh, Ephesians, uh, the fifth chapter. And uh, I'm going to also use uh, Colossians uh, 3, uh, 15 through 18. Um, both of those texts are quite similar. Where we're in Ephesians, uh, I, I like the way it's put against this gospel music concept and this singing concept. Uh, uh, a translation of Ephesians 5, uh, 18 says this. Be not drunk or filled until you are out of control, but in turn be filled with the Spirit of God speaking to yourselves in speaking and admonishing one another in Psalms which is the the book of Psalms or, or songs hymns we all know what hymns are those are odes to God and the spiritual song or the song of the Lord or something that is totally inspired by the Spirit of God singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, the same text or similar text appears in Colossians 3, 16 and 17, or 3, 16 through 18, but there's a phrase in there that they use, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So I just want to just kind of just take a look at this for a second, because when you say, <laughs> be not drunk, but be filled with the Spirit of God or, be, or don't be out of control in one area and the other area be in control. There is a power that comes with gospel music that in some cases, some people feel like it's too demonstrative or it's too excessive or it, it involves too much emotion or it involves too much energy but the contrast here is the same energy that you would put into something that would take you out of control or put you in danger is the same energy that you put into gospel music be not drunk where there is an excess, but be filled. And how are you filled? Well, you fill by teaching or admonishing or communicating with one another the words of songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Okay? So what I, what I want to kind of share is that 
gospel music is powerful because of the content. What you are singing about. I started out this time with you today with a song, His Presence is Here to Heal. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. His presence is here to heal. The content suggests that if I'm in his presence, I can receive a healing. <laughs> and that's the power of gospel music. It is the content that suggests either something is going to happen or something is happening and God is the author of it. So there's this speaking and communicating one another. So you're, you're speaking and you're communicating to each other the, the content. Because sometimes when you're, when you're in need of something to happen on the inside of you, it's great to have somebody else to discuss uh, uh, your situation with that can agree with you. And we'll get into agreement a little bit later, but... Uh, but that is, a, that is the amazing power of gospel music, is that content speaks of the things that you want to happen. I, I, I was blessed to write a song not too long ago that says, God is doing something wonderful in me. Something awesome and incredible that only he will get the glory. God is doing something wonderful in me. It's so wonderful. It's so marvelous. It's so, it's so beautiful. God's doing on the inside of me. So that's just a declaration of, of that content that is producing an actual result. And we see the example here in Ephesians 5 that speaking to each other, communicate with each other individually the words of songs, hymns, and spiritually inspired songs. Now, this is the thing that is very interesting about this text. It says singing audibly, congregationally, and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay, so here's what's, here's what's happening at this point. After you have understood the content or the context of song, then you are now internalizing the meaning of the content, and then you're letting the abundance of your heart, your mouth begins to speak. There is a creative uh, 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 aspect to uh, speaking those things that be not as though they were. I don't know if you ever heard the phrase, you know, some people say, uh, um, don't, don't speak that over me. Or don't speak that into my, in my atmosphere. Because words have power. Words are creative. So here in the text, it's saying that we are going to first understand content in music, discuss it just as far as teaching and training, and even just casually if, you, if you're having interaction. And then there's this heart thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and there's another text of scripture that says, where your heart is, there your treasure lies. I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody to do anything for me that is not from their heart. And how about this? God, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And real healing begins on the inside and manifests on the outside. And it's going to begin with that speaking it, declaring it, singing it, and then making melody in your heart to the Lord. I, I was in um, uh, Florida over the weekend um, um, doing some teaching, and I ran into a pastor that said to me, uh, there was a song, he, was, he, he had got COVID. 
He was in the hospital for 19 days. And uh, he, they, he was on oxygen. And uh, he asked for uh, someone to bring him his phone so he can play a song of healing while he was in the hospital. And over time, as he played the music of the song, he couldn't talk because he had an oxygen mask on. Couldn't sing because he had an oxygen mask on. But he was internally repeating the lyrics on the inside and then surrounding himself, the atmosphere on the outside with healing. And after 19 days, they reduced his oxygen. After 19 days, he was clear to leave out and while I was in Florida at that time, he preached the morning service. Because healing is something that has to go through a, there's a process to healing. Sometimes God will supernaturally instantly heal you in a moment, but oftentimes God heals you over time and over process. So, this is what this particular text is talking about, this process, this uh, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, if you look at the same text in Colossians 3:16 to 18, there's this interesting caveat added to the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs format. It says, it says there that we should sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And I thought that was so interesting because when you start talking about grace, grace is all of the good things that we don't deserve. And any time that you can in your heart begin a song of grace, that means that you're expecting something from God that wasn't on the list. <laughs> it's you're expecting to experience that favor of God, that supernatural experience with God that you didn't really know that you were eligible for. <laughs> so that's what that text says, singing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. And then it goes on in Colossians, giving thanks to God uh, for all things that you've been, <laughs> I have here, giving thanks to God for all things that you've been already singing about. And that's the amazing power of gospel music. It is the declaration, it is the, the celebration, it is the song of God's ability towards you. And that's what healing is. Healing is God's ability, and it actually belongs to us. But, but, but using gospel music as that vehicle to set atmospheres and to, and to uh, shape uh, mindsets and heart attitudes, because there's all kinds of healing. There's physical healing. There's mental healing. There's spiritual healing. There, there, there is... Uh, um, 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 you, you have uh, healing from hurts of your past. All of these kinds of things and creating that atmosphere and creating it through gospel music is something that is a powerful, powerful experience. So again, as I um, go forward, that Colossians text, giving thanks to God for all the things you've been singing about. How many people are grateful for all the things that God is able to do, not just what he's done? You know, you know one of the things we, 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 we do as, as Christians sometimes is we only like to rejoice when good things are happening. But the real power of gospel music is that you rejoice when good things is happening, when bad things is happening, because you don't, and you, and you rejoice for what is he's able to do. Ability means that he's not limited. <laughs> 
and being able to praise God for his ability, that is an amazing, amazing experience. So gospel music and healing, gospel music and healing, healing and gospel music. There is a connection with music uh, and what God is doing. There is music going on in heaven right now. There, there are songs being sung in heaven right now. And all of those songs that are, we are just doing the on earth as it is already in heaven. When we start setting that atmosphere of fear through singing and through song, that's what we are experiencing. Um, I want to, um, um, again, share a, 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 another uh, song with you guys. And, but we're gonna share, I'm going to share that at the end. Um, I was blessed to write a song called I Need You to Survive. And uh, um, that song talks about the healing of relationships amongst one another. Because a lot of times, if you want to wreck, if you want to know, you, you, uh, maybe I'll say it like this. A lot of times we look to God for things that, is, that are sitting right next to us. You know, somebody is saying, oh God, I, I just wish you blessed me with a job. I wish you blessed me with a job. And two rows back is somebody that has a business that needs uh, an employee. Or God, God, I wish I, 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 I'm in need of a financial miracle. I'm in, I, I, my finances are short. And there's somebody that just received something that they could bless you with. Sometimes your healing is sitting right next to you. So that's what that song talks about, that connection. I need you and you need me. And that's because we're all a part of the body of God. And I need you to stand with me and agree with me because we're all a part. It is his will that every need would be supplied, not from him, but amongst ourselves. And that's the power of, of gospel music. It gives you that thought and that concept that helps you to embrace something internally that manifests physically and tangibly. I'm going to ask Dr. McNeil to come now and he's going to continue our discussion. Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is such an honor to stand before you. And I want to thank you, David, for setting the theological uh, foundation for this discussion that we're having today um, that focuses on gospel music um, and the healing power of gospel music. Um, I, I echo everything that, uh, that David shared uh, prior. I uh, come to you this morning uh, as a worship educator and as a practitioner of gospel music and other musics as well. Um, and I also want to give credence to and recognition to Bishop Yvette Flunder while I'm, I'm thinking about it. She wasn't able to be with us uh, this morning uh, because of a family emergency, and we thought we would be able to uh, invite her in uh, through a Zoom um, conferencing kind of thing where she would be up here and we would see her and she, she would see us, and it didn't work out. But I think she's going to be with us later this afternoon at 1 o'clock uh, virtually. So we're hoping that uh, that, that will, will, um, will be possible. But you all pray for her uh, and her family. But um, as a practitioner and a worship educator uh, and a teacher of gospel music and other musics as well, I am um, thrilled about this conversation that weds together the formative power of gospel music and healing. And especially for 
the population of people, of the population of God's people, that a lot of our ministries, your ministries, and your churches, and your organizations serve. Uh, folks that are marginalized and pushed to the corners. Uh, how uh, gospel music can be a vehicle, a pathway to healing for those, for those populations of folks. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, take into consideration, and we can go to the first slide of the presentation, take into consideration this juxtaposition between gospel music and proclamation. So the theme of this conference is proclamation at the intersection. And so I want to create this intersection between gospel music and proclamation. Uh, and to talk about healing um, from that vantage point and to also see the juxtaposition between gospel and proclamation uh, uh, or to actually see congregational singing, corporate singing, through the lens of this juxtaposition between gospel music and proclamation. Uh, most people, most musicians, artists probably, uh, would uh, find these two disciplines uh, probably as, as uh, non-independent, non-relatable, even though they coexist and cohabitate in the uh, forum of worship. You have music and you have the sermon. And typically, uh, especially for people of color and the um, uh, folks that look like I, I do, those are the two main things that make up your church. If you don't have a good sermon or a good preacher and some good music, you ain't got no good church. We like good preaching and we like good music. And for a lot of us, that determines what church we go to. And for a lot of us, it, it also de uh, determines which Sunday we go to that church. Because if our choir ain't in the choir loft, I'm not going. Or I'm going to stay home and watch it from my sofa. So music is a very, very, very powerful, powerful, powerful um, vehicle that we have at our disposal. There have been churches that have been divided because of music, preferences. Okay. There are services that churches have that were formed because of the style of music. We have traditional at eight o'clock, contemporary at nine, and then blended at 11 or whatever the combination may be. Music is very powerful. Churches have split over music. Congregations have closed <laughs> because of music. Choirs have shut down. Choirs have been created over music. If, you, uh, if any of you are from the rural areas of the, this, this uh, country, uh, I'm from rural North Carolina. Um, back near uh, Fayetteville, uh, Fort Bragg, there's these little tiny, tiny towns. And there are thousands of churches in these tiny, tiny towns. And in these tiny, tiny towns are tiny, tiny churches. And in these tiny, tiny churches are millions of choirs. Millions of choirs. Your congregation is 50 or 100 men members, and you have seven choirs. It's the same people in different robes. Okay. And a lot of these choirs are formed because of somebody got mad or didn't get their way. So instead of having the gospel chorus, we're going to have gospel chorus number two. And then something happens in gospel chorus number two, and they get mad, and then they fall out and do gospel, create gospel chorus number three. So this is, is, is indicative of the power and the impact that music, and especially gospel music, has on uh, our culture as well as other cultures um, that uh, exist outside of the African-American worship experience. And so this understanding of gospel music as this entity, as this 
ministry, if you will, this ministry that happens inside uh, our congregations. And then this idea of proclamation. Okay? When you hear that word proclamation, what comes to mind for you? Just shout it out. Talk to me. What, when you hear the word proclamation, what does that mean? Make it known, Make it known okay? What else? Preaching. Yes. What else? The word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I didn't hear anybody say uh, music. That's interesting. Okay? Because we sometimes have this um, perception that music, and especially gospel music, is a helps ministry. And when, I, and when I say helps, I mean that it is used in our churches to help us get somewhere else. Okay? That it is not deemed as proclamation. Music is proclamation. Okay? The sermon that you associate with that word is a form of proclamation. It is not the only way to proclaim. Music, the arts, dance, drama, visual arts, photography, poetry can all proclaim. Okay? Not just your preaching, not just your sermon, not just your hoop. So if you don't get anything out of this time, today I want you to have a more expanded understanding of what proclamation is okay. it does not rest rule and abide with just the preacher proclamation happens across the entire fabric of worship not just at the preaching moment when we pray, we proclaim. When we sing, as David uh, um, so eloquently put it, especially our corporate singing, our congregational singing, we are proclaiming what God has done throughout salvation history and what God is doing now and what God will do in the future. Amen. Okay? So proclamation is this retelling, this recollection, this revelation, this retelling of the story of God and the story of God in Christ. Okay. As it has happened in the scriptures, okay. as it is happening now in, in, in our participation in that narrative and the stuff that we might not even uh, participate in in the future. The things that have yet to happen. Okay, for those of us that have been to seminary, we talk about eschatology, the eschatological aspects of proclamation. So what would it look like if we opened the door of proclamation okay, and invited gospel music and the arts inside that paradigm? and not bifurcate them and keep them separate? What if we said gospel music or the music of worship, the music that we sing in worship? And when I say gospel, I'm not just limited it to the stuff they put on the radio and the, your favorite gospel artist. I'm also thinking about hymns. I'm also thinking about protest songs. I'm also thinking about the spirituals. Those things speak of the things that God has done and the, the things that we have experienced as a people. Okay? It not only tells the narrative of God, but it also tells our narrative and our participation in God's narrative as a people or whoever your people may be, your participation in the bigger narrative of God. Gospel music as proclamation. Not outside of it, but as proclamation. And what makes gospel music proclamation is one word that David kept saying earlier, the content. 
And what is the content? When I say content, what does that mean? Especially in, ter in terms of gospel music. The message, the theology, the words. The words. One of the things that I think where we miss the formative power and the healing power of this music is a lot of times when we gravitate gravitate to the beat and the rhythm and how it makes us feel aesthetically we miss out on the healing we miss out on the possibilities when we run to the style before we examine the content style and content are not the same keep it on that slide yes Style and content are not the, st the same. The content, as we've said uh, uh, all this during this time, is the, is, are, are the lyrics, is the word, is the proclamation. That's the proclamation. It's the story of God. It's our story and participation in that. Okay. that it, the words. What is it saying? Okay. Who's speaking in the song? What are they saying? Who are they speaking to? What are they speaking about? These are the questions that sometimes we forget to ask when we make choices for the songs that we sing in our worship, for the songs that we include in our community uh, events that we might have. Okay. And we think we're doing a great thing by singing this song because it's popular and it feels good and it's fast. We like fast songs. We need something fast. Everything fast is not favorable. Look at the lyrics. Hey. Paul, what, would, what would worship be like if we had a rubric for exegeting the lyrics of our songs? A rubric for asking questions before we say we're gonna sing that and not let the yardstick or the barometer be because it's new because it's the latest and greatest because i heard it on the radio but what is it saying who is it including who is it excluding and does the theology of this song, or the lack thereof, match the theology of this house? Or match the theology of this organization? We are what we sing. And we sing what we are. One of the biggest lies that was told to me when I was growing up. Sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt. That is a lie. Words matter. And David underscored that beautifully uh, earlier in this presentation. Words matter, folks. I don't care if you are not an ordained pastor. If you are just in the community doing work or not in the four walls of the church, whatever the work that you are doing, if you have an opportunity to make a decision around collective singing, corporate singing, and we should be singing, okay. even taking the necessary precautions that we need to take, you know, in this, in this pandemic that we're in, but we've been through so much as a people, and even the past couple of years in this pandemic, we need to sing. We need to praise, we need to lament. We need both. But as we create spaces for, for corporate bodies and communities of faith to sing, let's pause and examine what we are seeing, singing. And what we are saying about ourselves when we sing this song. Okay. You never know who's out there listening to the content of your message. 
the minister of music or music director or praise and worship leader, whatever you want to call it, the person who makes decisions for worship for your congregation or for your organization, is what that is one of the most powerful positions okay, that any one person can have that they get to choose the words that they will place on the lips of God's people. Somebody makes a decision on behalf of the congregation. Okay? That position is more than just choosing songs, filling slots on the bulletin, in the bulletin. But what if we saw that responsibility as a vehicle to lead congregations corporately and people individually to their healing because we looked at the lyrical content and did not gravitate and stay married to the style they're not the same the style is the package that the content comes in okay? you can have an awesome awesome uh, text about Easter or about the meaning of Easter and its significance that's the content it is it can be scripturally based theologically sound but the style might be gospel rap but if we take the rap off of it the gospel rap off of it, or the gospel hip-hop style away from it and examine the text and if it speaks of Easter or speaks of scripture or speaks of God or speaks of Christ in a way that it, it um, uh, affirm, affirms what's in scripture and affirms what we believe as a worship community, that is a legitimate choice for me. Where we get caught up sometimes is we, we see, oh, that's hip hop, that's rap. Nope. We can't have it up in here. Can we pause and see what, what does it say? Eh? Just like us as black folks, we get judged by the cover of who we are. And people make assumptions before they even examine the inside of it. So I want to challenge you. Nobody don't want to sing them old hymns. Nobody, nobody wants that praise and what that music is so loud. And no, there are arguments on both camps. And I, and I guarantee you when you go to it, almost any church, okay, you have folks that like what they like. The, the old school folk like the hymns and the anthems and the spirituals. And you have folks that are, you know, contemporary praise and worship, CCM. And then you have folks that are in the middle that like, we all have our preferences. And sometimes our preferences can get in the way of the message that needs to go forth. What does the congregation need to hear today? Can we start there with our choices? Versus what do I want the praise team to say? What do I think will get the house? Okay. What do I think will make the people shout? Sometimes we don't need to shout, y'all. Sometimes we need to lament. Sometimes we need to sit in our mess. Sometimes we need to ask and, be, and create space for asking, God, where are you? And we can do that through gospel music. We can do that through corporate song. But we've got to be disciplined enough to sit down and ask the questions. So theological reflection on worship is just as important as it is preparing for your sermons. Okay. People's lives are at stake. And you'll be surprised at the number of people who listen intently to what you're saying. It matters. Words matter. Our healing depends 
on our content and our commitment to it. Next slide. So we talked about proclamation. And so I went to Google, as anybody would probably do when they put, uh, prepare for a presentation, and I typed in proclamation. And these two scriptures came up, and the Luke is actually a, a recapitulation of the Isaiah text, and most of you uh, probably know that. But this whole notion of proclamation and understanding gospel music, one of the definitions that people use to define it is the good news, right? The good news of Jesus, the good news of, of God in Christ, the good news of God's participation in, in, in salvation, and the good news of liberation and freedom. Okay? All of those things are, are matter, matter there. Would you read this text for me, the Isaiah passage? Let's read together. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. So proclamation, in the context of proclamation, are all of these exciting um, embodied kinds of metaphors here that when proclamation happens, stuff is undone. When true proclamation comes forward, okay, the poor, who probably had some bad news, hear good news <laughs> to bind up the broken heart that music congregational singing can be a vehicle a way of gathering people's broken pieces of their hearts and assembling the hearts back together again that this can happen through music okay? your sermon is not the only thing that can do this the arts have the power to do this. If it's done with integrity and the content okay, is, 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 is pri of, of primary order, this is what can happen. Freedom for the captives and release from darkness for, for the prisoners. Freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. How many of your songs that your choir sings or that your praise team or that your congregation sings announces this? Freedom from the captives and release from the darkness for, for the prisoners. Okay. Most of our music, I would, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to jump out on the limb here and say this. Most of our music when it when in, in terms of gospel music uh, is music of response and not music of revelation. Most of our gospel music is grounded in response. And what do I mean by that? A response is things that benefit me. Things that I get for me personally. Things that make me feel connected to God. Things that elevate my individual spirituality outside of community. Okay. There's nothing wrong with those songs okay. if they are not, if they are attached to a revelation before it. Okay. So something is revealed about God about God in Christ, about God in Scripture, and then a response. Something uh, is, is, is done or sung to respond to that revelation. If you have response, 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 all throughout, of a, out, throughout a service, and you never reveal anything about God, 
It's idolatry. So, as we pick our music for our, our worship services and for our community events, look at the content. Look at the words. Is it revelation or is it response? Revelation. It's a song that is grounded in scripture. A song that paraphrases scripture. A song that talks about God's saving acts in scripture. Songs that, that speak about our journey and our participation in God's narrative. Okay? Songs that center God and Jesus and the works of God and Jesus, the attributes of Christianity, the things that we need to be striving for. That's revelation. Okay? Response is because that has been revealed, then I can get my blessing. This is why I, I sing. This is why I, I want to be used by the Lord. This, this is where the I, me, my songs have value because of a revelation that was revealed. Okay. If we're constantly singing songs that promote us individually and we forget the we, us, our and our, and our collective identity in Christ Jesus, we miss out on our healing, our corporate healing, our corporate unity. Okay? Revelation, response. They're two different things. Okay? One of the things I want to suggest to you is that those of you who, who do music or make uh, choices about music in your, in your congregation or in your organization, to come up with medleys. Of, of songs of response and then a song of revelation that might come after it. Okay? One of the, um, the great ones that, um, that people do, and I'm, I'm sure you've, some of you have probably done it, uh, the song, How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all of see how great, how great is our God, you're the name above. And it, th so that song talks about God and it's focus, it's God focus. Okay? And it, it uplifts the attributes of God. Then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul that be, then it becomes personal because i've made a revelation about what god is and who god is and what god has done and because of that this is my response So finding ways to examine our text and making sure that we marry revelation and response uh, at every given opportunity that we can. Sometimes it happens across the worship service. Doesn't necessarily have to happen back to back. Okay? But what I am advocating is uh, a steady diet of just one without the other. Because things can be revealed about God. I've been in some services where there's been uh, lots of good revelation. But the congregation was not given a chance to respond. Okay. So they lean on each other. So we need revelation. We need response. Next slide. Okay. Uh, go back. Uh, okay, next one. All right, good. Okay, so this one right here. Benefits of congregational singing as proclamation and formation. Congregational singing is a dying art form in our churches. Okay? Not e even before uh, COVID, the pandemic. Okay? Congregations come to worship for the most part to watch worship be done for them. So how can we, as worship leaders, remind them that by definition, the word liturgy 
is the work of the people that as a gathered community, gathered faith community, our healing is dependent upon the work that we do collectively. Okay. How much of your worship service is congregational centered? How much outside of singing? Okay, that, um, and, and, I mean, and sometimes you can stand up there and invite them and participate, have the words on the screen, and they still won't sing. And in that situation, some teaching needs to take place. Maybe in Bible study. Maybe a couple of minutes in, in choir rehearsal. Uh, or on a Zoom. Uh, or at a retreat. Okay? And not just a one-time thing. That maybe there needs to be a preaching series about worship. And the nature of singing. And the impact of, of music and the arts in worship. And how worship and music can be proclamation okay so that proclamation is corporate it's inclusive it's the work of the people okay it's not the performance of the choir and the praise team and the pastor okay their responsibility the purpose of the choir the praise team the the leadership the folks that are sitting up front is to undergird the work of the people that they can't do by themselves Okay. The most important organization in your congregation, the uh, most important musical organization in your church is your congregation, not your choir. The choir is designed to undergird the work of the congregation. To do the work that the congregation cannot do by itself, to help them do their worship work. Right. Presentational music, congregational music. Presentational music is the music that the congregation cannot do, cannot participate in. Sometimes the choir will, will, will sing a song that the congregation cannot participate on readily. Okay. Maybe they can hop on at the vamp at the end or on the drive or at some other point. Okay. But presentational music is the music that the choir or the praise team does to God on behalf of the congregation. They're doing it on behalf of the congregation. Okay? Not necessarily to the congregation for the congregation's entertainment. No. It is an offering to God on behalf of the congregation. When dancers come out to dance, to do liturgical dance, they are dancing on behalf of the congregation who cannot get up and do the choreography that they did, that they learned. They learned that choreography on behalf of the congregation. Not because we are the First Baptist liturgical dance ministry. So look at us, do our little moves, and y'all clap for us. No, we dance because we're doing it for you. To God, as an offering on your behalf, on behalf of the congregation. We do it on behalf of the congregation. Okay? So, uh, congregational singing is corporate and it's inclusive. It involves every. It's corporal. means it's, it's embodied. There's, especially in African American music. Okay? We have movement in our music. In a lot of our music. You're going to see tonight in the opening worship one of the most dynamic community choirs that's what all of these chairs are for that's based here in dallas they're called marquin middleton and the miracle chorale they're based here in dallas texas they sing with a whole lot of body and a whole lot of movement you're going to see some choreography tonight i wish y'all could have been in here last night for the sound check they rocked it and they're going, to, they're going to be here tonight to help lead us in worship. Okay? We're going to do some singing together corporately. We're going to open the service with lift every voice and sing. Okay? Lift every voice. Not just the talented voices, but every voice. And sing. Till earth and heaven ring. But gospel music has, has this, this embodiment principle that's attached to it. That when we move, when we clap... Okay. That, that, is, that is our testimony to the text. 
That is our, that is our embodiment of, we believe what we're singing. And we affirm it with this movement. Okay? It's corporal. It's creedal. Okay? Again, we sing what we believe and we believe what we sing. One of the ways that you can judge the theology of a church is give me the top 25 songs that your choir, uh, that your congregation can sing. I'll tell you what you believe. What are the top 25 songs that your congregation can sing in the absence of the choir or the praise team? Do, does your church or your community have its own congregational repertoire? The music that the congregation can sing if the choir decides not to show up for worship. Can worship still happen? If you don't have a congregational repertoire, you need to build one. Okay? And that's ongoing. Teaching songs that the congregation can sing. And sometimes there are songs that happen over time, that come about over time, that just stick with a congregation. I am thinking also about uh, Total Praise, which... Um, when uh, Richard recorded it years ago, it was a presentational song. But because so many people sang it and adopted it, it's now become a congregate. Everybody knows total praise. It is the national anthem of black gospel music. It is. Okay? So it, is, it has become a part of our creed because we have adopted it in our culture. Okay? And that congregational music is also ecclesial, that is corporate, that it is much bigger than the church, our church on the corner. That as we sing, we participate in what David said earlier, in the singing that's going on already in heaven. And also the singing that is going on around the world that we cannot hear by other justice communities and, and uh, communities of faith who are, who are focused on justice. That we deserve to sing. The people deserve to sing. One of the things that, we have, that has duped us out of congregational singing is this infatuation with perfection and performance. That has silenced a lot of folks from singing. People don't sing because... Oh, my voice ain't as good as, you know, you got, when you come into this church, you, you, you have to sing right, you know. And, you know, people are, 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 are scared to lend their voices, okay? Some people have what they call vocal disenfranchisement, where something happened, some trauma happened to them in a choir rehearsal or in a music room, music classroom, or in some situation where somebody said, your voice is bad. Do not sing. You can't sing. And that trauma sat in. Some of the best singers in your church sitting out there in your congregation. And they won't sing because somebody told them their voice was bad. Their voice didn't matter. So you as a worship leader, has to, we have to remind our folks, you're part of a bigger bigger church than even just this one congregation here. Okay? We are the, the, the church Catholic, small c. The church universal. And when we sing, we participate with other congregations around the world that are singing as well. So your voice is needed. Okay? Next slide. These are a few things that uh, I listed to, to empower people's, the congregation song that you can keep in mind as ideas of ways to get people singing, to get people singing and experiencing the glory of God. Bring excellence to the art of congregational singing. Don't consider it, yeah, this is something we just got to do. Let's just kind of fumble through these hymns. And then we get to the gospel. That's the real music. Okay? Bring that same, the same excellence that you bring to your gospel and your praise and worship Bring it to the congregational stuff as well. Okay? Unison singing. There's nothing wrong with that. We get ready to sing a song that is based in unison. I need you to survive. 
That is one way to instantly build a choir or to create community is to have folks sing in unison. Okay? That's not a bad thing. Hospitable leadership. Sometimes, sometimes the, the biggest turnoff from people participating in worship and singing in worship is because the person who holds this mic says some crass stuff. Worship leaders are... Some, uh, yeah, okay, that's my cue. Worship leaders are some of the most rude and inhospitable people in the church because of the power of this microphone. It is a weapon of mass destruction. It depends on whose hands it's in. Okay? What we say to people in worship how we chastise them because they're not getting with us. How we beat up on people because they're not giving you what you thought you deserve as the worship leader. What does it mean to be hospitable in leading worship? Okay. Inviting people into the moment of worship. And using words of invitation and, and, uh, and participation that make people want to sing. Okay? Affirm and expand the con your congregation's repertoire. We talked about that. Songs that center the narrative of God. That we're looking at the content. Balance songs of revelation with songs of response. We talk make space for songs of lament to reside with songs of praise and celebration. Pull out a pass me not, oh gentle Savior, every now and then. Okay? We're so infatuated with praise, 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 praise. When people are hurting inside. And sometimes we just need to sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. And, be, and that's worship. It's just as worshipful as the boom, 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 boom. But we haven't had church if we don't. People are hurting, y'all. People need healing. And people need to be able to say, I can come to church and sing my pain. Sing in my pain. What does, it, what does that, to, to be able to go to a faith community and say, I can bring my pain in this community and know that this community will hold my pain. As I am hurting. Songs of Lament can, can help, help with that. To integrate more we, us, our songs in worship. To remind us of our collective unity. Okay? And to develop a rubric. Some questions of lyrical exegesis. That help us make the best choices for worship. Our healing depends on this. Our congregations deserve better. Your communities deserve better. And as you assemble people, not only in the four walls of the church, but the stuff that you do outside of the church, if there's an opportunity to sing, sing. And if it doesn't sound melodious, that's okay. If you're singing good to content, that's all that matters. Don't let the style dupe you from singing the, the words and the text that people need to hear, that people need to experience. That's where the healing is, in the content. David, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I want you to lead us in the singing of I Need You to Survive. And I think we have the text. I wanna, we don't want to assume that everybody knows the words, which probably most of you do, but we want to, uh, there we go. We want to um, make way for people to participate. And that's the, the other thing. As you, as you lead worship and, um, and, and find that people are not participating, make, if you give people the tools, it might help them enter in. So we did not want to assume everybody knew the words. 
So we made a slide for the text. And so David is going to come in, uh, in his own way and lead us into the singing of this beloved song, I Need You to Survive, that he penned and wrote for Hezekiah Walker, which started out as a presentational song and now has evolved into a congregational song. People all over the world sing this song. So thank you, my brother, for this. I need you to survive. Before we sing, would you all do me a favor and celebrate Dr. Tony McNeil? What a great, great presentation. Um, I was blessed, and I will send my check appropriately uh, when I uh, use his stuff. Uh, before we sing that, I just want, I, I was remembering testing one two I was remiss um, when I was up um, I did not uh, let you all know that I did not come to Dallas today empty-handed I've got some music um, I've been blessed to write, write and record a series of CDs they're called Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs they come in volumes and they have different songs on there I brought some of those with me um, I brought uh, uh, another project I produced uh, for a church in uh, Macon, Georgia. The song uh, that I was nominated for a Grammy for was recorded on this song, he on this project here. And uh, I also bought, I, I've been impressed. Um, it's a kind of a long story, but uh, about, about three years ago, um, I was inboxed um, by a young lady who wanted to come to a time of music sharing that I was having in New York City. And she said, and, and it was someone that I grew up with, and she said to me, I really would like to come, David, but I haven't left my house in eight months. I'm afraid to leave my home. And I'm in therapy to just be able to just leave my house without fear of something going to happen to me. And so what I started to do about three or four years ago was after she told me this, I, I, I said, well, you know what? I'm going to post something every day about fear. And I hope this will be encouraging to you. So I just started posting every day about just different aspects of fear. Fear, don't fear. And, and like I said in my presentation that do not fear appears in the Bible 365 times, one for every day. And that's something that people battle with. So what, what I ended up doing was I wrote a woman's devotional journal called The Fearless Woman. And it's 245 pages. It's a full color devotional journal. And this is for women. And then I got one for the men that says 40 days with no fear. So I brought both of those with me along with some music. And uh, you can see me afterwards if you'd like to get something. Now, I want to talk about I Need You to Survive real quick because uh, a lot of people uh, uh, may have heard the song, but you don't know the story. When I first taught the song, I Need You to Survive, to Bishop Hezekiah Walker, um, he looked at me very strangely and said, what do you expect me to do with this song? It doesn't have three parts. It's unison. We've never done a unison song on an album before. He couldn't even tell me of a choir that actually had a unison song that was totally unison. And I thought about it. I know some songs that have part unison, but not all the way unison. But I said to Bishop Walker when I taught it to him, I said, I said, let me try it out at one of your services. Because I had wrote the song and I was attending a small church and decided to uh, uh, at the small church, we would do it every time we close a service. So I, I came to one of Bishop Walker's services and uh, uh, I had written another song that year, a song called We Made It, We Survived was on that album. So, so uh, we did that song and then, I, and then um, Bishop said to me, he said, hey David, do that survive song. And so I went to the keyboard and I started to sing uh, uh, I Need to Survive. And we sang the song for about an hour and 40 minutes. And there was so much healing and so much uh, uh, relationship mending. And he just looked over at me. He looked over at me and just kind of shrugged his shoulders like, what is going on? And I went just like this. I don't know what's going on either. 
but it, it, it was just such an amazing blessing. And, I, and the blessing of the song, like I said earlier, is the fact that we look to God for so many things when God has placed so many things in us for us to share with one another. So let's, let's do a little bit of that. Where's my, uh, where's my singer at? I thought I saw her. Come on, come on up here and sing with me. Y'all give her a hand. <laughs> Allison, right? Come on, Allison. Now, again, as Dr. McNeil talked about, uh, music, our music is only as powerful as our individual expressions of it. If you, don't, if you don't participate, you can't get anything out of it. So, I Need to Survive is a song that we all can participate on. And it would be, I know we're in a COVID environment, and I know we're in a, 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 um, a, a, a quarantining environment, but everybody in here should have got tested. So, if you're near somebody, it would be great if you can touch someone on their shoulder or on their hand, get some hand sanitizer or something at some point and then, uh, and, and share the message of the song, okay? I need you you need me, we're all a part of God's body, stand with me, agree with me, agree with me, we're all a part of God's body, it is his will, it is his will, that every need be, you are important to me, to survive you are important to me I need you to survive let's try that one more time everybody I need you I need you and you need me you need me we're all a part we're all a part of God's body I need you to stand with me Agree with me. Agree with me. We're all apart. We're all apart. Of it God is His body. will that every need be supplied. It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I need you to survive. Look at the person next to you on your right and left. Tell them you are important. That's it. I need you to survive. Let's do that chorus one more time. One more time, everybody. I need you. Y'all say it. I need you. Tell somebody, you need me. You need me. We're all apart. We're all apart of God. And I need you to stand with me. Stand with me. And agree with me. Agree with me. We're agree with me for healing. It is his will. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I need you to survive. You are important to me. Great. Now we're gonna go to the. Uh, I pray for you. Y'all say it. I pray. For you pray you. for me. You pray for I me. I love you. I love. I need you to survive. I need you to. And listen, survive. I won't harm you. I won't harm with the words from my mouth. With words from my mouth. I love you. I love. And I need you to survive. I need you to survive. I pray for you. I pray. For you pray you. for me. You pray. I love you. I, love I need you to survive. I need you to survive. I won't harm I you. Won't harm with you. words from my with mouth. Words from my mouth. I love you. I love and I 
I need you to survive. Let's come on, let's take it up a little bit. I pray. You pray for me. You pray. Lift your voice. I love you. I need you. gotta tell somebody I won't harm you. I won't with the words from my mouth. With words from my mouth. I love you. I love you. I need you to survive. I need you to survive. I'm gonna pray for you. I pray. You pray for me. You pray for I love you. I love I need you. you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. Can we go up one more time? Come on, let's take it up. I need you to survive. I pray. I pray for you. You pray for me. You pray for I love you. I love you. I need you. I need you to survive. And I won't harm you. I power of gospel music and healing. You feel better, don't you? Burdens down. I feel better. So much better since I laid my burdens down. <laughs> all right thank y'all so much for this oh fantastic pre-conference workshop on music and healing um we are going to break for lunch um the lunch is on your own there are many restaurants in the hotel we also have yoga that will, it's optional yoga that will happen in the junior ballroom, which is directly behind us. Um, enjoy this, stay cool, cause it's hot outside, but enjoy your break. We will be back at 2.30, thank you. <laughs>